Good morning. Uh, my name is Katya Kiefer, and I am a neuropsychologist with the Marshfield Clinic Health System in Marshfield, Wisconsin. And um, I have the privilege to uh, work with the Barta Beetle Center of Excellence here, along with some of my colleagues. And today um, I am going to do a brief presentation on the cognitive, behavioral, and motor and sensory characteristics of individuals with Barde beetle syndrome. So to give you a quick outline um, of today, so first um, I will talk about how uh, the field of neuropsychology is relevant for individuals with BBS. Um, second, we'll talk about some developmental and cognitive characteristics. So we'll talk about intellectual functioning, memory, language, and attention. You'll notice that this is not a complete list of cognitive skills. So things, for example, uh, like uh, visual spatial skills, um, executive functioning. Um, some of these other areas are not really well investigated in the literature yet, and so we don't have as much information about those. Um, also, I'll talk uh, a, li a little bit about sensory and motor features, and also neurobehavioral features, um, and uh, the um, higher prevalence of autism spectrum features um, uh, in individuals with BBS. And then also I'll touch a little bit on some of the neuroimaging um, studies and particularly uh, how it may relate to cognitive functioning, although um, the relationship between the imaging findings and um, a person's presentation is really unclear at this point. Okay, so um, Barda beetle syndrome um, is a uh, uh, has quite a varied presentation, and uh, cognitive difficulties and developmental delays have been one of the cardinal features of BBS. Here's where neuropsychology comes in. Uh, neuropsychology is a field that studies uh, brain behavior relationships. Um, it's kind of a mixture between psychology, um, neurology, neuroscience, um, and so what we do as neuropsychologists are um, in-depth assessments of uh, how a person's brain works. Um, so we will do intellectual and cognitive functioning assessments. Um, and the reason I separate intellectual and cognitive is because when we're talking about intellectual functioning, as I'll talk about in the following slides, we're talking about something kind of specific such as IQ scores. And cognitive functioning in general refers to uh, other fields um, in cognition like memory, attention, language, and so forth. Um, we'll, uh, as, a, as a part of neuropsychological evaluation, we also assess neurodevelopmental features. So these are um, features that appear um, in childhood uh, that suggest kind of a different trajectory of um, neurological development. Um, these are things like developmental delays and such. Um, we also always assess uh, things that could potentially interfere with a person's functioning or cognitive functioning. So these are, for example, things like anxiety, depression symptoms, um, so any psychiatric or psychological issues. Um, these are well known to, uh, one, cause cognitive issues, but also interfere with existing cognitive difficulties. So these are important to address. And then we also look at psychosocial factors. So, um, you know, is the person facing any particular stressors, for example? So as you'll see in the remainder of this presentation, the research on the cognitive and behavioral aspects of BBS is quite limited. And the probably the most limiting factor is the sample size. You'll see that the sample sizes are really small. Um, and so really all of these can be considered as exploratory studies. The sample sizes are small, but also there are just uh, quite few studies that actually exist um, uh, on this topic. And so most of the ones that exist, you'll see mentioned in this presentation. 
Um, the other thing that makes it a bit challenging uh, is the variability in presentation. And so sometimes it can be hard to see a particular pattern emerge just because um, individuals can present with such a range of um, symptoms and abilities. So uh, with regard to development, um, looking at the literature, there seems to be agreement uh, that um, children with BBS have developmental delays um, and that the developmental delays are uh, across various uh, domains, including speech and language. So what this means is a later um, onset of, of uh, single words and speech, uh, but also um, difficulty with uh, pronouncing and intelligibility of speech. Um, motor development involving both fine and uh, gross motor skills. Um, social and emotional development, so this is kind of level of maturity um, and uh, ability to form and maintain age-appropriate social relationships, um, appreciate social norms, and so forth. And then finally, adaptive skill development. So this is the um, kind of independent skills, um, taking care of one's own um, hygiene, uh, uh, managing uh, understanding money, being able to make food, those kinds of things. So unfortunately, I wish I could provide more um, a specific information on this. However, uh, most of this information comes from case reports and um, anecdotal evidence as opposed to any specific identification of just how late kids with BBS are with some of these milestones. And I imagine that uh, just like with cognitive functioning, there's likely a very significant degree of variability in this as well. Okay, so here we go into of some of the neuropsychological features. And the first thing we're going to talk about is intellectual functioning. Here I have to provide a couple of definitions. When we talk about intellectual functioning, um, in most cases we're talking about IQ scores. And so I wanted to mention a couple of things about IQ scores. So first of all, um, the most common indicator of intellectual functioning is called a full-scale IQ. It is derived from standardized measures assessing uh, several domains. Um, these are verbal intellectual skills, visual-spatial intellectual skills, attention and working memory, and processing speed. So, um, so that all of these parts go into an IQ score, uh, and that is what makes the full-scale IQ. Um, in individuals with BBS, there is uh, an added difficulty with assessment, and that is that clearly the visual spatial intellectual functioning and also quite a few of the processing speed um, tests on the um, IQ tests are very vision based. And so um, you can get a more complete and comprehensive assessment of intellectual capacity that involves visual spatial abilities and processing speed skills um, earlier on um, in uh, individuals with BBS when their vision is um, more intact. And as the vision declines, then um, it becomes uh, more difficult to obtain, let's say, a full-scale IQ. And so sometimes um, in the studies, only verbal IQ and uh, working memory and attention are reported. That's because of um, the visual limitations. Um, so in terms of how IQ relates to intellectual disability, um, so there are specific diagnostic criteria for intellectual disability. Generally speaking, um, IQ uh, for a diagnosis of intellectual disability is somewhere in the range of 70 and below, um, and there are also impairments in adaptive functioning. Um, and so one, a clinician has to take um, all of the test scores and adaptive functioning as well as the, the trajectory and history um, of the difficulties into account to make a diagnosis of intellectual disability. But intellectual disability is directly related to, um, to IQ. So just to give you an example, a full-scale IQ of 100 is average. 
um, and that's 50th percentile. So if you look here on the normal uh, curve, the normal distribution IQ, just like many other um, skills, is normally distributed. And so the top of the peak um, there is uh, 50th percentile, and you can see that um, the majority of people kind of fall within that light blue area. And then as the um, the distribution wanes down, and then fewer and fewer people fall kind of at the ends of the distribution. So to give you kind of a perspective here, so a full-scale IQ of 70 is at the second uh, percentile, so it's about two standard deviations below the mean. Okay, so... Uh, so what does the research say about um, IQ scores in uh, individuals with BBS? So the probably the best and the most comprehensive study uh, was done by Brinkman et al. And you can find um, the references th uh, on the last page of this presentation. Um, and it it's also the study that has the largest number of uh, participants with BBS, which um, is still very few, uh, which is 36. And also not all of them were able to complete the cognitive assessment. So you can see the N there in each of the lines means the number of people who completed that part of the testing. And so um, in this study, the mean full-scale IQ was uh, 75, almost 76. So this would be considered um, above the range of intellectual disability, but um, kind of in the borderline to low average range um, of functioning. And you, I put the ranges down, and the range is sort of the highest and the lowest scores, so the, the two kind of extremes. And you can see the degree of variability, which is for a full-scale IQ, is between 48 and 100 being completely in the average range. So, and, and this is an observation that we've made in the clinic as well with seeing individuals with BBS, is that there's just a very, very significant degree of variability between patients. Um, so verbal comprehension index are those verbal intellectual skills. These are things like abstract verbal reasoning, vocabulary knowledge, and you can see that that um, it, the standard score for that is 81, um, and the range is 55 to 108. Again, very wide range, but even an, in the mean, um, it is in the low average range. The mean working memory index is also 81, and you can see the range there as well, so that's also in the low average range. So uh, this suggests that the two measures that are probably the most accurate for individuals with BBS, because these two don't involve any um, visual requirements, that those suggest that, yes, uh, intellectual functioning is slightly below the average range on average uh, with significant degree of variability, but certainly also not in the impaired range, but more in the low average range. Um, perceptual reasoning index was 78.5, uh, um, and you can see that the number of people who were able to complete those tests was lower, and the range, again, was very large. And the processing speed index was uh, 71, so that is the lowest. But again, we have to remember that many of these tasks do rely on uh, visual processing, and so that's kind of a, a complicated factor there. In our clinic, what we've observed is that uh, when we assess visual-spatial skills in individuals with BBS uh, whose vision is um, still quite good, their visual-spatial skills are actually um, quite strong. There isn't a uh, specific difficulty in visual-spatial abilities beyond the vision loss that occurs um, later in the course. Um, so again, I wanted to highlight the very significant degree of uh, variability in the scores. And also I wanted to mention that the studies did find that um, IQ scores were not associated with BBS type. Um, in this particular study, I believe that most participants were had either BBS 1 um, or BBS 10, uh, but it, it didn't, the IQ scores didn't seem to differ based on the BBS type.
a few other IQ findings that are presented in a somewhat different way. So Benuna and Green st uh, study, uh, Benuna Green study from 2011 um, that had 26 participants with BBS, and they looked at it um, as a you know what percentage of the individuals met diagnostic criteria for intellectual disability. So intellectual disability would typically be IQ be below 70, and um, also def uh, deficits in adaptive skills. And so what they found is that 26% met diagnostic criteria for intellectual disability, which um, does coincide with the following study by Kerr et al. from 2016 that had 24 participants that also found that about 20 to 25 percent meet diagnostic criteria for intellectual disability. Um, and, uh, and that's really encouraging. My understanding based on reading the literature is that the older literature was suggesting that BBS almost invariably was associated with very significant cognitive impairments. And now we have a much better understanding of the range and that really only 20 to 25% uh, meet diagnostic criteria for intellectual disability. Um, the, this, the second study listed there, Kerr et al., also uh, looks at um, uh, verbal intellectual skills and what percentage of their uh, group um, had broadly average verbal intellectual skills. And what it looks like is that 42% of the individuals had broadly average um, intellectual skills and 38% um, had uh, moderately impaired. So you can see the percentiles there. So um, broadly average would be 16th through 84th percentile as defined in this study and moderately impaired would be 3rd through 15th percentile. And then 20% um, had severely impaired verbal intellectual skills and again that's kind of consistent again with that um, estimate of um, how often intellectual disability occurs in individuals with BBS. What's interesting too is, um, you know, one might think that um, quite a bit of adaptive functioning difficulties in individuals with BBS would be associated with uh, visual difficulties. However, what the studies are finding is that intellectual functioning um, is strongly correlated with adaptive functioning. Visual uh, skills are correlated with motor skills, which makes intuitive sense, but are not strongly correlated with adaptive functioning. So it seems that you know, the vision loss is not the main driving factor in, um, ad in adaptive and independent functioning in individuals with BBS. Okay, looking at some other cognitive skills. So memory is definitely a relative strength, uh, both for uh, learning of information and then delayed recall of information. That same study, Brinkman et al. from 2016, found that learning and uh, delayed recall was in the average range, that's the mean of their um, of their uh, sample was in the average range. And uh, Kerr et al. also found that 60% had average learning and memory as well. And that is also something that we, did, we do see in the clinic as well, that, um, that, the, that memory and ability to learn new information, ability to remember, um, is really one of the big strengths in individuals with BBS. Um, so there are some studies suggesting that there is a developmental delay in language. Um, and when looking at um, specific language skills, it looks like um, there is some difficulty um, in some areas, and in particular in, in that language domain, if you go to the last one called visual naming, this is when an individual is, sees a picture and they name the object that they're seeing, um, you can see that the um, th there was very significant difficulty um, in uh, visual naming. However, one also has to wonder about you know visual skills and whether the participants really were truly able to recognize easily what the pictures were representing. Um, that really wasn't uh, commented on or controlled for in that particular study. Other uh, verbal skills include what's called verbal fluency. Verbal fluency is um, kind of your brain's ability to um, to come up with words as you're speaking uh, with ease. So it, it requires kind of a searching strategy that's effective. And so um, 
the mean verbal uh, fluency in the Brinkman study was around the 16th percentile for individuals with BBS, which is um, in the low average range. In the Kerr et al. study, 55% had average verbal fluency, which they defined as 16th to 84th percentile. So, um, you know, it, it looks like verbal fluency is not something that represents a significant impairment uh, for most individuals uh, with BBS, and the majority actually have verbal fluency within the normal range. Um, attention does seem to represent difficulty, and so when they did attention tasks, especially auditory attention tasks, they, it looks like about 80% um, of individuals with BBS have a moderate to severe attentional difficulties. And so attentional difficulties would be things like your attention span, for example, or how much information one is able to hold um, at the forefront of their mind and work with it, but that's what's called working memory, as well as more complex as aspects of attention, like being able to switch back and forth between two things, uh, kind of alternating attention, being able to inhibit um, one aspect of the environment in favor of another. Um, and I'll touch briefly on the motor and sensory skills. So um, on in all the studies, uh, there was, uh, um, and by all, I mean the, the two that included um, motor testing, um, the, there was a test of fine um, visual motor skills. So the, these were pegs that the participants had to pick up and place them in little holes. Um, as quickly as possible, and there was uh, significant impairment in all participants on this particular task. And of course, um, as previously mentioned, visual acuity is correlated with motor skill, as of course our, our visual skills um, uh, do facilitate motor skills. Uh, so that means individuals with BBS may have trouble doing some of the fine motor skills, such as, um, you know, neat handwriting, uh, tying shoelaces, um, being able to do zippers, buttons, those kinds of things. Um, and then another interesting area is, is uh, that's emerging in the sensory domain is the area of olfaction or of sense of smell. And so we know that there's difficulty with vision that develops eventually in individuals with BBS. However, um, what uh, is not as known is that uh, nearly all individuals with BBS examined in these studies showed uh, a difficulty with a sense of smell. And so in two of the studies, at least 50% had anosmia, which means inability to smell at all, or severe hyposmia, which is um, essentially a significantly reduced sense of smell. Um, and uh, the severity of the difficulty with the sense of smell was associated with severity of visual difficulties, so that the worse uh, the visual skills are, the worse the olfactory skills are as well, and the olfactory difficulty is was not associated with age, so seemingly it is something that is present from an early age as opposed to something that declines with time. I think that's also an important aspect that I forgot to mention in the um, kind of the overall cognitive functioning, the IQ and other skills, is that to date there's really no evidence that BBS is a um, progressive cognitive disorder, meaning that there's really no evidence that there is a cognitive decline over time. So of course, you know, for olfactory difficulty, um, this, this can have an extra, uh, add an extra wrinkle into things like um, eating behavior as well as um, just safety awareness as well in terms of being able to smell um, and be warned about different dangers in the environment. So <clears throat> there are some neuroimaging studies um, uh, of individuals with BBS. For example, um, Baker et al. in 2011 had 10 participants and they did brain MRIs. What they found was a reduced gray matter volume in several brain regions, including the hipp hippocampus, anterior temporal lobes, and medial orbitofrontal cortex. 
these are areas that are um, highly responsible for things like um, memory, for example, behavior, the medial orbital frontal cortex is often responsible for some of our more complex behaviors, like being able to um, to make decisions uh, and so forth. And so um, the exact meaning of this is not really known, and also the exact uh, timing of these issues, because um, there's likely some different... Um, s some structural differences in the brains of, of individuals with BBS from the very beginning. However, um, there may also be some changes that developed with time, uh, for example, adaptations to loss of vision. Um, a different study uh, found that 42.3% uh, had hippocampal dysgenesis on brain MRI. So this is this would be kind of abnormally formed um, hippocampi, uh, which are uh, t uh, structures in our uh, temporal lobes that are again very strongly correlated with um, memory and learning. Interestingly, though, and this is I think one of the mysteries um, is that we don't quite understand is that actually when you look at memory, as I previously said, memory and learning are actually some of the strengths of individuals with BBS. So then it's interesting to find this area of hippocampal difficulty on imaging. And this is kind of an example of somehow, uh, you know, when imaging doesn't quite match the clinical findings. And so there was an interesting study in 2014, um, and it, it was a mouse model of BBS, and they looked at learning um, in these mice, and they didn't really find difficulties with learning in these mice, um, meaning that they were learning as well as, and, and remembering things as well as uh, mice without BBS. However, what they found was impaired aversive memory, which is um, essentially you know, aversive memories when there is a component to learning that's an emotional or aversive component. And so seemingly while um, the uh, other mice were able to learn um, that, for example, an, an experience was unpleasant or that something unpleasant was going to come, whereas the mice with BBS weren't really able to learn that and were at essentially attempting to do the same task the same way, um, despite uh, having an aversive experience with it before. So I think that's a really interesting finding and something that maybe needs to be looked at in the future because, of course, there are different types of learning and our learning um, is very much enhanced by the emotional factors surrounding that learning experience. And so if um, those are in not as salient in individuals with PPS, then maybe that that facilitation is not happening or maybe uh, that that emotional um, kind of connection to the learning is not occurring. Um, so, but, you know, these are very interesting uh, things that one can speculate about, but I don't think there's been any follow-up on, uh, you know, what that could mean or a follow-up in a human uh, model. So uh, I'll try to go uh, quickly here through the behavioral and psychological characteristics. So something that we've noticed in the clinic um, and also something that's highlighted very regularly in the literature on BBS is that there seems to be some kind of a genetic vulnerability to features of autism spectrum disorder and difficulties with social skills in individuals with BBS regardless of um, their, their vision status. Um, so a couple of studies, uh, again, the studies that you've seen before, Kerr et al. and Brinkman et al. found that about 71% of participants had features of autism spectrum disorder, and this was independent of age. And then the Brinkman et al. found that 80% of participants had mild to moderate impairments in social skills. Now, th these do not mean autism spectrum diagnosis, because that uh, the, the diagnosis of autism spectrum involves um, a kind of a thorough assessment of multiple factors and skills and um, symptoms, but nevertheless, there seems to be a suggestion that individuals with BBS are um, more likely to experience some of the symptoms that can be observed 
um, in autism spectrum disorders. So these are things like difficulty with social approach um, and social responsiveness, uh, difficulty with social skill and um, understanding of social cues. Um, these would be difficulties with forming and maintaining age-appropriate relationships. There's some um, difficulty with um, inflexibility and adherence to uh, routines, repetitive behavior, those kinds of uh, things. And so, um, <clears throat> so I think that's a, a really important uh, thing, and, and uh, I will uh, mention that in, in, uh, in the next slide, I believe. So the other findings um, is that looking at the psychological adjustment of individuals with PBS, it looks like the internalizing difficulties are much more common than externalizing ones. So the internalizing ones are ones that are um, kind of directed towards oneself or more internally experienced and observed and are less visible to other individuals. So these are things like depression, anxiety, kind of obsessive compulsive um, thoughts uh, versus externalizing features that are more rare. These are things like acting out, aggression, hyperactivity. Those are relatively rare in individuals with PBS. So when I was looking through this literature, there is uh, some call towards an earlier diagnosis and a, uh, an understanding that this disorder can be so variable and difficult to diagnose early on, and sometimes it takes a long time for an individual to get the correct diagnosis. And so there were calls um, in some of the articles to do more kind of early screening. So for example, if a child has obesity plus a history of developmental delay, for example, that um, that they should immediately be then tested uh, for some of these um, disorders uh, that, that have those features, including BBS. And the reason that the identification is so important is because maybe there is room for more early intervention. And essentially, my thinking is that in individuals with BBS, some of the health issues and some of the visual difficulties may overshadow some of the cognitive um, and social skill difficulties that may exist. And so the, um, the care may go more towards those aspects. However, we know that actually the cognitive and behavioral features are more related to future adaptive and independent functioning compared to physical and vision issues. And so it's definitely a very important um, thing to identify early. And we know that early intervention works, for example, for individuals with autism spectrum disorder and other kinds of cognitive difficulties. And so that early knowing that people with BBS are more likely to experience some of these difficulties with social skills and so forth, maybe early intervention in that domain would provide that extra benefit um, and an extra boost to future adaptive skills and independence. Um, and of course, also educational interventions that are aimed more at cognitive and learning problems uh, rather than kind of physical and vision issues. Um, specific therapies such as occupational therapy for boosting independence skills um, and uh, for uh, fine motor skills. And then finally, counseling and psychological intervention. As previously mentioned, um, there is a, a greater prevalence of um, things like uh, internalizing disorders. And also the um, what, what I've seen in the clinic too is the sense of loss that comes with impending vision loss. And so um, there certainly are health psychologists and um, interventions that, uh, that could be helpful um, in these areas. And finally, what I wanted to mention is that you know, as, as many studies and as we as clinicians sometimes in the clinic as well, um, we, we tend to focus on what the weaknesses are, what the difficulties are, how do we help those and so forth. And so I think it's really important to consider that that intellectual functioning, cognitive ability, 
um, all of those are kind of one aspect of a person. And so it's really important to look at other kinds of skills and strengths and try to capitalize on, on those. And so, for example, we know that individuals with BBS have strong memory. Our experience in the clinic uh, with individuals with BBS is that they're just a great pleasure to work with, um, very cooperative, hardworking. Um, typically quite stable and predictable behavior and emotions during testing, which is not something to be taken for granted because this is typically a relatively lengthy work intensive um, session of uh, brain work and that can be quite frustrating, but that is something that we rarely ever see. And so for most people with BBS, there seems to be pretty good frustration tolerance. There is usually a good sense of humor and ability to connect with an examiner and usually quite strong relationships uh, with family as well. And so I think it's very important to kind of look at the individual person in totality as opposed to, um, in, you know, dissecting in only, let's say, intellectual functioning or some other um, aspect. And so um, thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity to be able to speak to this. And I hope that in the clinic here and in the Research Institute, we can contribute to future acquisition of knowledge in this area. And then in the last section here, I do have references um, to the articles that I um, referred to um, as well. OK, thank you very much.